Good morning, church. We are so grateful that you guys are with us this morning, and we just want to say welcome to those that are joining us online as well. We are uh, in this series called Proximate, and uh, last week I challenged you maybe with a new idea or a way of thinking, and that was to get proximate to your weaknesses. Uh, I don't know that anyone has ever challenged me with such a thought, but one of the things that I know that prevents me from getting close to other people that are different than me oftentimes is the way that I view myself. And I don't know if you realize or not, but I'm pretty convinced that if you had complex issues at 13, in some shape or form, they lag around even when you're 63. And I want you to realize that those complex issues that you face sometimes could be there, as Paul described in 2 Corinthians 12, as a thorn in our flesh type of experience. Now, we don't know exactly what the thorn in his flesh was, but here's what we do know. We do know that God allows certain things in our life for the purposes of drawing us near to him and our weaknesses. And I know that I have lots of flaws and lots of weaknesses. Matter of fact, this last week, I got well acquainted when, with one of those. And so I have a struggle with people pleasing. And when I let someone down, I, it, it can tend to stir in me for uh, oftentimes not only hours, but days. And it, It just changes my way of thinking. And so oftentimes when I struggle with something, pride, perfectionism, people pleasing, then what I do is I have to draw near to other people that I feel comfortable with, and I have to tell them sometimes even to justify my own experiences. But in this week, it was an opportunity for me really just to draw near to God and just to just be okay with who God created me to be. And that's really the purpose. And here's why. Because if you struggle to see the weaknesses in your life, then what happens is is we push people away, not just because of their differences, but for me, in my past, I've pushed people away for two reasons. One is because of their strengths, I felt like they were oftentimes superior than us, and and particularly to me. And so if they were superior to me and and my weaknesses were going to be exposed, and guess what? It was easier for me to keep them at a distance. At the other point is if I ever saw somebody with greater weaknesses than me, it was easy to expose them and oftentimes use their weaknesses at the expense of making me funny. And so oftentimes we, we view it in one of two ways. And so that's why I wanted you to get acquainted with that. And here's why is because today as we dive in, I want you to see that the way that you view yourself the things that you've been taught, in a sense, the the narrative that you hold and believe actually influences so much of what it is not only we believe, but the decisions that we make. And you may wonder, well, how how in the world do I come up with a narrative? And you're going to hear me say that multiple times today. And so when I think narrative, I want you to think worldview, the way that you think, the things that you know, the things that, in a sense, drive the decisions that influence your behavior. Where do those come from? Because they're innate in us. And I'll, I'll tell you, they come from places and, and people that we believe. Matter of fact, do y'all, y'all remember when the internet was first kind of getting going? Like, y- y'all remember uh, those emails that you used to get from your beautiful grandmother? Or maybe it was your mom, or maybe it was your favorite aunt, and she had your, you know, your well-being at mind. And, and what she wanted to do was just send you this, this incredibly long email about some Nigerian guy that potentially could steal all your riches. Or... You know, maybe about this uh, person that was in your area and he was uh, robbing houses, et cetera. Or, you know, this other thing that was going to possibly steal your identity. And oftentimes I would get those. I'm not going to tell you who they're from. I mean, it was a family member and, and my grandma didn't send emails. And so um, I had somebody that cared well for me. And, and so she would send me these things. And I would often have to send back and say, hey, there's this beautiful thing called Snopes.com. And um, mom... If you'll check that out before you send me that email, then you're likely to get a much more gracious response. But if you would please quit sending me these long emails that if you would just do a little homework, you wouldn't have to send, it would be much appreciated because I've got plenty to do. And I started thinking about, like, why did my mom send me those emails? And obviously it's because she cared about me, but here's why. It's because someone that she believed and trusted had sent it to her. And it informed her way of thinking. Matter of fact, here's what's interesting. Facebook generated a report in the last couple of years that 50% of all information shared on Facebook right now is what we would consider fake news. That means out of one out of every two posts, in essence, that you'll see in your news feed is generated as fake news, which leads us to oftentimes believe things that our friends believe. 
Matter of fact, the only reason we share them is because we seem to align with a certain group of people that share similar thoughts or beliefs or motives as we do. And so that's why uh, a couple of years ago, um, this, this uh, one happened to be shared more than anything else ever. And it was this thing about Pro- President Obama re- uh, banning the reciting of the pledge in public schools. Okay, It happened a few Octobers ago. And it generated 2.1 million shares, comments, and likes in a two-month period. It is the number one fake news of all time. And I'm pretty sure that somebody in this room shared it, okay? Uh, we happen to have a president now that, I mean, he's prone to some fake news. Um, not too long ago, uh, he got 801,000 shares, likes, and comments based off of the one-way ticket to Africa or Mexico because we love you so much we're willing to send you to back home. And you go, I shared that one, you know? And you go, well, why is it that we share the fake news we do? And here's why, because there's something in us that believes the group that shared it. There's something in us that says, I I wouldn't mind seeing this particular thing happen. And and this has actually all happened in our lives for decades. Matter of fact, I don't know if you realize it or not, but Things similar to this have been happening since the the show Sesame Street back in the day. Let me just show you a clip. Maybe it'll be nostalgic for some of you, but it just shows you the differences that have informed your beliefs. Check it out. Three of these kids belong together. Three of these kids are kind of the same. But one of these kids is doing his own thing. Now it's time to play our game. It's time to play our game. Which of these kids is doing his own thing? Come on, can you tell which one? And you guess which kid is doing his own thing? Yes, before my song is done. And now my song is done. So, so was it that she was upside down or she was just a different color? I mean, what was it? Yeah, so it all depends on your narrative, doesn't it? Because as kids viewing it, you go, what is it? What's different? Because there's multiple things that are different about those characters. Now, the reason I say that is because all of us have grown up informing ourselves with different narratives, and they come from a variety of places. And so I asked you this question, like, where did you come up with a viewpoint or a narrative that you did? And I'll tell you, it started, first of all, at your family. The way that you were raised, your parents, the things that they taught you, the, the beliefs that you held, the church that you went to, the people you hung around, it, it, was, it was from your siblings and, and their culture, their friends, and uh, not just them, but also your grandparents, the influence they had. I mean, did your grandfather say derogatory, derogatory uh, terms about other people that weren't like you? Was that just a part of your language in terms of the way you viewed life? And not just your, your family, but also your friendships. I mean, think about your friends, the, the families that were tied to your friendships, about the sorority sisters that you hung around, about your college friends, about the people that you worked with initially, the people that you went to church with. Think about not just that, but your military brothers, about the things that you experienced with all of these different people. And then from there, it, it went not just to friendships, but also just um, to culture. And you got movies, you got books, you've got uh, TV episodes. Now we got reality TV. I mean, that's incredible, right? You've got interests, you've got politics, you've got all of these things that shape you. And then you also have just your own experiences, like just things that have happened to you, things that you've seen that you wish you never have saw, things that you were exposed to, your past, your hurts, your betrayals, things that just went awry. And those ultimately make up who we are. And every single one of us in this room is uniquely different. But what's interesting is, is that we tend to find ourselves with similar thought processes as many of the people in our room. And in, as we think about those thought process they, that have been based off our narratives, it then what? It shows oftentimes the experiences that we are willing to share with others, some that are like us and then many that aren't. And the question that I have is, okay, if you were to really look at your narrative and you really to begin to look at the way that you were raised, the thought processes that inform your decisions, 
The question I have is, are you right? Are you the only one that seemed to lock down the truth in terms of what a narrative should be like? Does your thought process look much like Jesus? Or does it look more like an American? I mean, because do you realize that when you start thinking about your narrative, that there's many things that it informs, and it really creates some barriers in our cultures. Some things that I would call kind of an us versus them mentality. And you go, well, I don't know if I really believe that. No, I want you to realize that your narrative and your viewpoint oftentimes causes you to group with one people that you're alike and oftentimes tends to push others that, that aren't like you and you exclude them. And it's happening all around us. Matter of fact, just let me list a few. I mean, I think there's one that we can all kind of agree on, Americans versus Russians, right? I mean, like we, there you go. I mean, that's, we've kind of been at odds with them for quite a few years. Rich versus poor, Republicans versus Democrats, Christians against Islamists, maybe Christians versus atheists, Baptists against Catholics, blacks versus white, cowboys versus eagles. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Those that stand and those that kneel. North against south, Texas versus California. Well, I mean, it's really Texas against the world, isn't it? Yeah. Statue stands or statues go. I mean, do you realize all the things that are happening around us? Culturally, politically, ethically, ethnicity-based, tons of things. And my question is, is when I list those, like a couple of them are, are a little bit funny, okay, particularly if you're from California or if you're an Eagles fan, but others strike a chord in us. And they strike a chord in us because of our narrative. I mean, particularly on the kneeling and standing issue. Did you serve in the armed forces? Are you a military person? Do you, have, do you have really ties in terms of America before you have ties to Jesus? Should they have a choice? Should they not? I mean, are you going to boycott the NFL because you don't agree with it? Just turn off the TV because hey, that means what? You get proximate to the issue. You seek to understand. No, it just says, I don't want to deal with it. But the question is, is that, does Jesus give us that permission? Does Jesus give us the permission just to settle into our narrative and be okay with the way we think? And anybody that doesn't think like us, hey, just unfriend us. If you don't like the things that I post, hey, just, just delete me. That's fine. That's what you see all the time. And that's, I don't, I think that's what misrepresents who Jesus is and ultimately what he desires us to be in our culture. And, and you may go, I, I just don't know about that, Brandon. Well, well, let me just give you the words of Jesus. That way you, you don't have to worry about my opinion, Okay. Uh, and so if you get your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, and let's just dive in and see. And uh, by the way, <clears throat> while you're turning there, let me just go ahead and give a quick commercial here to this, that if there's anything that's said today that you go, you know, I highly disagree with, I dispute it with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, okay, that adamantly, then just know this, I would love for us to have a cup of coffee, because all I want to do is seek to understand your point, and I hope that you'll seek to understand mine. But I pray that nothing that's ever said from this stage says, hey, we just, have to, we just have to part the fellowship right away. Because I don't think that's the goal. I think the goal is, is, is to find ways that we seek to understand each other's narratives. Because we don't base our narratives casually, but because of experiences, because of past, because of all these things. Got me? And so the way you, the way you are is the way you are. And that's okay. Because I'm not right and you're wrong. But we do have to allow ourselves to look honestly at the way we are and ask ourselves, God, is, is there a way that I can grow? Is there more I can learn? And so here we go. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48, Jesus is giving us this Sermon on the Mount. It's an incredibly lengthy but awesome sermon. And so for any of you that complain about the length of my sermons, uh, I wish you would have been sitting on that hill that day with Jesus um, because I don't think you would have questioned him on this one. Um, but in verse 38, after he had given several different things already for you to digest and think about, he then goes on to kind of this idea of an eye for an eye, but also how you treat other people. In verse 38, he says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, what happened in the Jewish culture is they'd come up with this belief system, and it was in your Old Testament, that an eye for an eye, meaning they do something to you, you have the opportunity to provide retribution, that you can do it right back. The struggle with that, though, is that over time, the Pharisees began to move the principle, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, out of its proper place in the Old Testament, which was a civil law, into one of a personal one. And so when you have a civil law, what you need to realize is that God has given us government for such things. Like, for instance, there is a time for war and a time for peace. 
The question is, is when is the time for war? And as a Christian, is it ever time for you, in essence, to call for war on a brother? And what we realize is that that's really not our job. In a personal matter, our job is to love others the way that God has loved us, 1 John 4. But we have, what, the government who can take care of some civil areas, the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth type retribution. Because there are times where the government has to protect the people that live under their authority. And we need to allow them to do their job in that area. But in this case, what was convenient for the Pharisees was just to go, hey, eye for eye, tooth for a tooth. If they do something to me, I have the opportunity to do it back. And Jesus has a problem with that type of thinking. And the reason why is because they've taken it out of the proper sphere that it should have been placed in and they put it in their personal life. Then verse 39 says, But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him also. Now, you've heard that, right? I mean, matter of fact, you've heard that so much in your life, you're like, I just don't really even know what that looks like. I mean, as a man, that kind of in some ways challenges even your authority and your manhood. Like, I'm not going to just stand there and let somebody else slap me time and time and time again just so I could say I'm like Jesus. Matter of fact, one of our weaknesses is, as a man, is that you should respect me, and you should, what, see my authority, and you should see that I am a man. And so we've always kind of been taught that, look, I like the idea that Jesus teaches, turn the the cheek. I like that. Give them the right cheek. But out on the playground, isn't there a place that you turn the right cheek once, they insult you, they jab at you, it's okay, But even as a Christian man, you go, but listen, son, when he talks about your mama, it's all good. (laughs) And and then you're like, hey, you just beat him down, and then if you go to the principal's office, don't worry, I'll bail you out. If they they suspend you from school for three days, it's great. We'll take a daddy trip. We'll go hunt some deer, and we'll go have a good time in the woods. Like, there you go. Let's reward them, okay? And it's a struggle that I think we've always had in some degree. Because we love the idea of Jesus' teaching that we should be kind and compassionate. But the question then goes, but when do we go too far of being kind? And the answer is, I don't think we ever get there. I don't know that we ever get so pushed that we look like Jesus. I mean, Jesus, he stood in six different trials, accused unjustly, though he was innocent. And in all six trials, he was a a sheep that was silent before his shears. See, we always have a word. We always have an an opportunity to justify. We always have something that we want to say. And we really do struggle with just taking insults and jabs and hardships. We really do struggle with the idea of turning the other cheek. And I'm not talking about that first insult. I'm talking about continually. Now, what I I don't think the scripture is saying is that you should lay down and, and just let somebody torment and beat you. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, is more times than not, we never even get to the point of demonstrating Jesus. Typically, our flesh just rises up and we just go, I think this is right. It feels right. Let's do it. And I would just tell you as a man here that typically what I feel is always wrong because my feelings can't be trusted. And so I have to come something that's more concrete and more conclusive, which is the word of God, and which is why we have to talk about issues like we are today, this idea of us versus them. Jesus patiently would bear insults, hardships. He would be spit upon and rejected. Matter of fact, that's why he's the savior of the world, and that's why we're trying to grow into him. But here's what I want you to hear. Jesus didn't save you not to sanctify you. Jesus saved you so that he could grow you in these areas. Then in verse 39, he would say, but I I do say to you, do not, uh, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other. And then he goes on, and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. So the idea here is this. If anybody's going to sue you, then hey, just go ahead and give him your outer garment as well. And so this idea of the tunic was what they kept close to the body. And he goes, if they're going to take your tunic, just go ahead and give them the whole thing. Give them your cloak as well. And so the idea there is this, is just be willing to gladly part with anything you could legally keep. Now, that's really tough, but that was kind of the teaching of that day. Now, just a real quick side note, I don't see anywhere in Scripture that you have a reason as a believer to sue another person, whether they be a believer or an unbeliever. I just don't see it. It's something that's in our culture, but you don't see that in terms of Jesus' teaching. And then verse 41, he gives another fascinating thought. He goes, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. 
Now, under military law, a Roman soldier could force a Jewish citizen to carry his, uh, his bags for a mile. And that was just something that you do. And it wasn't because the Jews loved the Romans. Matter of fact, the reason that you have this idea of uh, a zealot, which is a person who was zealous for God but hated Rome, wanted to overthrow them, the reason they wanted Jesus to come back as a conquering king, one who would overthrow Rome, is not because they loved Rome. It's because they hated them. They despised them. And almost in, in things of this, think about the person with differences than you. For some of you in here, it's the black man. For some of you, it's the person that chose to kneel, or some of you, it's the one who chose to stand. For some of you, it's the Baptist. For some of you, it's the one that says the statues must stay. Whatever it is, can you imagine that person that you despise so much saying that you should, you should be forced to walk with me and carry my stuff for a mile? And then being obedient to Jesus, you go, okay, I'm going to do it. And then let me ask you a question. What's the first thing you say? man, this is a complete joy. That's not, that's not your heart, is it? Like you're thinking like, all I want to do is get a mile. And when I get a mile, I'm probably just going to accidentally open that bag to where it just all falls out. And I go, hey, have a nice day. But Jesus goes, no, I want you to take it two miles. The idea is that you would gladly submit yourself that even though there's angst and animosity and there's anger in your heart, that you would say, I'm going to carry this person's bags in which I despise so much another mile simply to let them see joy and compassion in the midst of my anger and even though my narrative suggests that I should have never carried it at all. That's what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is challenging the very way we think. And then he says in verse 42, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. All of this, everything we've read gives you the premise of Romans 12, 21. Do not become, what, overcome by evil, but come, overcome evil with good. That's the idea. Overcome evil with good. Be good to those that you don't agree with, to those who de- you despise, to those who do not treat you well, to those whose narratives are not like you. Like, be good to them. Show salt and light to them. Show grace and humility to them. And you go, that's incredibly difficult to do. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying that that's what Jesus would desire for us as we grow in the likeness of him. And then he goes on. And in verse 43, I think he really begins to challenge all of us, and particularly even me, to the core. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, what you see in the Old Testament is that you should love your neighbor. You never, ever hear or see the idea of hate your enemy. It's never in the scriptures. But as Jews grew in in their knowledge and in their belief system, they had no problem tacking on a handful of other things to the law. They had no problem adding a few legalistic things. Matter of fact, I would say that almost every denomination there is has added a few things to their liking. Got me? I would say that all of us in some ways realize that there are things that we can tend to add over time. Well, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had no problem adding the idea of hate your enemy. And what that probably meant in their context was simply this. We love the Jewish people. And in order to be a Jewish person, then you had to identify with Yahweh and you had to, what, take part in circumcision. So he's just basically saying, if you're not like us, you're not one of the circumcised, and our God is not your God, then we, we're we not going to like you. And think about this for just a second. We really don't have a problem with that to some degree. Like, hey, have you ever questioned God's goodness as, as he called the Israelites out of every other known country in the world and said, they're going to be my own? Have you, ever, have you ever struggled? Have you ever cried over the fact that little David slayed the big giant Philistine? No, you rejoiced over that, didn't you? Like, yeah, man, the little man wins again. Like, you've never even thought through all these processes. Like, you've never even questioned, like, the goodness of God. Like, it's just, okay, this is just who it is. It's how it is. It, it, little man wins. God's, the, he slays the giant. And the reason why is because you're, like, okay with hating your enemy. It, it's almost like it's okay. It, And I want you to realize that the purpose of those God stories in the Old Testament is not so that you would hate the Philistines. 
It's not so that you would hate the Samaritans. Matter of fact, in, in John 4, you're going to see Jesus hang around a Samaritan woman. Two people in the culture that he wouldn't hang around. Those that would be considered an enemy of the Jewish state. And so why does he do that? And he says, I don't want you to hate your enemy, but instead, look what he says. But I say, do you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you? Now, let me ask you a question. In your prayer journal, how many of you have just a column that says enemies? <laughs> None of us, right? Like, we want to forget our enemies. Like, Lord, don't remind me about the, that person who's so flawed. Like, we don't want to think about that. But Jesus goes, no, we got to think about who those people are that we despise because of our narratives, because of our belief system, because of the things they've done to us, because of the things we did to them, because of our past experiences, because of the way they talked about my little boy, about the things that they did to my little girl. Whatever it is, there are people that you hate. There are people that in your life you go, I struggle with these people. I'm not going to be quick to pray for them. And Jesus goes, you should. And in verse 45, he says, so that you do that, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Now, this is where God really began to challenge me. And when I stumbled on this probably about 10 years ago in a way that was fresh for me, it changed my life, I think. Honestly, I think that Stone Point Church is probably born out of something similar to this. And here's why. He goes, I want you to, I want you to pray for those that are your enemies, for those that persecute you. I want you to love them. I want you to realize that when you're able to love people who are your enemies, love people who persecute you, who insult you, who jeer and jab at you, he goes, that's not saying a whole lot about you. It's saying a whole lot about the God who is sanctifying you. See, when you're able to bear hardships and insults and Everything that people say about you, it, it's not because you're a really strong person, but it's because God's a really strong God. And it's because he is conforming you into the pattern of his image. And here's his image. He goes on and he shows you the character of God. And I'll tell you why it changed my life. He says, for he makes his son rise, meaning God, on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. He goes, even the evil farmer gets rain. I mean, think about that. I mean, as someone who you go, I love God. I try to be obedient to him. I try to like everybody and treat everybody with hospitality. And you're sitting on your front porch in the middle of a drought. And you've got this neighbor who his dog's always on your property, who his cows are always out, who always does the wrong thing who's constantly bickering and griping and complaining. And to be honest with you, you just don't really care for him, okay? And in the middle of the drought, as you're sitting on your front porch, kind of wishing that his place would burn up and his house would go away, it starts to rain. And it seems to be on the other side of the county road. And you don't get a drop. And then, like, there's just an abundance of rain coming down. And you go, Lord, what is wrong with this picture? God, why is it that the evil farmer that I wish would go away is getting rain? And God, I'm good. I mean, you know I love you, God. And I'm not getting anything. And then I realized the idea of this passage is so that you would understand the character of God. Because see, I lived in a time about 15 years ago that I grew up with a set of belief systems, a narrative that informed my way of thinking that everybody else was wrong. And I remember becoming very legalistic in my way of thinking. I mean, to the point that it almost made me miserable. Like, I believed that I had to listen to a certain set of music. I believed that I had to do certain things daily that in order to know and understand and, and all, honestly just live in God's goodness, that it was a bunch of things I had to do. The problem was is that I realized how many other people it ostracized in terms of my way of thinking. And I probably lived with this idea, this thought process from the time that I was 16 to the time I was 24. So almost really 20 years ago, I remember dating a girl 
and she broke up with me because of the fact I hounded her over not listening to Christian music. Like, that's just kind of where I was. I thought, God, I'm good, and everybody else is kind of evil. The problem with, with that is that I did not exude the heart of God. And matter of fact, the, I was tired of being around people and churches that made me think in a narrow-minded view. And I wanted to be a place where there could be life and there could be forgiveness and that there could be joy in the midst of all of our mistakes and all of our pain. I wanted to have life and have it to the full. And I just knew that in the way I thought and the way that I lived, it didn't seem to be that. But in some ways, I felt like there was a river of life flowing into me, and then somehow it just emptied into the depths of my soul, and it was dead, kind of like the Dead Sea. just kind of sour, dead, no life there. And then God just informed me, like, Brandon, the world is not always the way you see it. And even if it is the way you see it, you need to know that I am good, and I'm good to those who are good, and I'm good to those who aren't. And I'm going to let it rain everywhere that I choose to let it rain. And it changed my thought process. Because who am I to get to decide what God does? Where rain draw, uh, seems to fall and where it doesn't. And then he goes on and he questions our thought process even more. He says, for if you love those who love you, what re reward do you have? Right? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more than you are you doing than others? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? I mean, basically, he just goes, hey, do you, do you really pat yourself on the back because you're in a Facebook group that you align with, and, and y'all post politic things together, and you pat each other on the back, and you say amen, and man, we really agree, like, because you're loving each other well? Like, it's not hard to love someone that, that you agree with everything they say. Do you know the hardest thing? The most unsettling thing, even in this moment, is to listen to a guy that you really don't know, challenge you on all your belief systems, and to go, I'm not sure I agree with everything. And then you just want to walk out of this room in this very instant and go, I'm not ever coming back here. No, see, that's who Jesus is talking to today. Because he's saying, look, if you really are struggling with my words and my teaching, he goes, what would it look like if you sought to understand them? He goes, I'm not going to commend you because you love the people who are like you. I'm not, I'm not going to give you accolades in the heavenlies because you were good to the people who came into your church that looked just like you. Because what happens when that family comes in the back door that they don't look like you? They're not the same color as you. They're not the same ethnicity as you. They don't seem to, in a sense, fit in with who you think should, should be here. He goes, what are you going to do with them? How are you going to treat them? And I think all of us, in some way in our life, we have that. And he goes, and it's what you do with that person that matters most to me. That person that's not like you is the one I'm concerned about. And that's why Jesus talked about Samaritans. It's why he hung out with one at the woman at the well in John 4. It's why Jesus would do things that oftentimes blow our mind. And we think, well, it's just Jesus. No, no, no. Here's the key. Look at this last verse, and then I'm going to just challenge you with a few things. He goes, verse 48, after he says all of these things, he goes, now you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And see, like, you just go, okay, well, I'm just going to close my Bible on that one. Like, I don't even know, like, what does he mean? Like, how am I going to be perfect? Because the Bible clearly says that we're all sinners, we fall short of the glory of God. And so this must just be one of those those things that we just we really can't settle on. It seems to be a contradiction in our Bible. Like, I mean, we know that we're not perfect. Matter of fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse 18, he goes, there's nothing good that lives in me apart from Christ. And so how am I going to be perfect? And here's the point. If you look at the word in the Greek, it's not the idea of perfect, but if you look at the same context in which Paul uses it time and time and time again, it's the idea of a wholeness. It's the idea of really being comfortable in who God has made you, and then you becoming more like him in the character of God. Just as God says, be holy as I am holy, that's the idea of this. And what he's trying to help you see is this. Listen, if you, if you love everybody and hate your enemy, he goes, that's not the character of God. If you're okay with a narrative in your mind that leaves out certain groups of people because of their beliefs or because of their color or because of their ethnicity, he goes, that's not the heart of God. 
He goes, the heart of God is that you would see people the way I see people. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that one of your prayers? God, would you help me to see people the way that you see them? And I would say, by and large, the answer is no. And so how do we get to the place where we go, God, help me to see people the way you see them? And I would just tell you, number one, is that you have to be willing to evaluate your narrative. Like, is it okay for you to say, God, would you just help me to evaluate the way I think? I mean, think about that. The, the things that you believe, the churches that you choose, about faith, about God, about humanity, about politics, about our country, about education, about people who kneel or people who stand, about blacks or whites. I mean, would, God, am I right? God, am I the only one in this room that has it right? And, and maybe in this room, maybe there happens to be one person in this room that your narrative is spot on. That you're the most Christ-centered, most godly person in here, and and every decision you make seems to be informed by God's word and his grace in your life. Can I just confess to you that that's not me? And so if it is you, I would love to meet you. And I would love to learn from you. But I'll tell you that it's not me. I'm one of the ones who struggles to see God in everything. I'm one of the ones who seems to be narrow-minded and can be a bigot. And I don't want that for me, and I don't want it for our church. And so if you're going to evaluate your narrative, one of the things that will help is if you're willing to get proximate to those that you don't understand. Now, this is where it gets a little bit com- uncomfortable. It, it's leading out of your weakness, honestly. When you know your weakness and you realize that God is strong for you, then you can lead out of those. And just, you can just admit them right up front and go, this is who I am and these are my struggles. And then you can lead from that position and go, hey, I just don't have my life all together, but I am seeking to understand more about what's going on around me in our world, in our culture. But let me ask you a question. Are you willing to get that uncomfortable that you would actually get proximate to people that you don't understand? And I'll tell you that if you go, yeah, I'm willing to, I'm willing to get close to the people I don't understand, I'll, I'll tell you real quickly how you can know if that's true for you. So here it is. This may be the most profound thing I say all day, and so you might write it down. You'll know if you're willing to get proximate to people that you don't understand, if you're a learner or if you're a critic. For instance, when you don't understand something, whether it comes from a black man, whether it comes from someone who kneels and you go, I'm just going to turn off my TV, or if it comes from someone that's a Muslim or an atheist, or it's just somebody you don't like, then when you don't understand them, you kick into one of two modes, and typically it's critic mode. If you're a learner, then you'll ask the question, will you help me to understand your position? Will you help me to understand the way you think? I don't think your way right now, but maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I didn't see something in this political conversation, and I just want to ask you the question, what am I missing? What has informed your way of thinking? And I can tell you that depending on your life experiences, your family, your friends, the circumstances, and all the things that have happened to you, that's going to inform part of the decision. So if you sought to understand why the person thinks that way, that's huge. But I'll tell you what happens by and large is this, is that when you don't understand something, you naturally become a critic. Let me just give it to you in the church world, okay? A church is growing. It's really vibrant. There's life. There's people that seem to be coming to faith in Christ. And if you're a, if you're a learner, then you go, I don't know what y'all are doing over there, but I want to learn. Teach me. Maybe we're missing something. Maybe we need to change the way that we welcome guests, or maybe we're just missing something. Or... Typically, what churches do as critics, they go, oh, that place, they just teach a watered-down Bible. Uh, they, all they're doing is just tickling ears. They don't really care about anything else. Do you see it? What keeps us from getting proximate is that we're scared to death of learning something that's different than our narrative, and so we would naturally get in critic mode, and we criticize and criticize and criticize. Why? Because we don't want to take the time to get close enough to understand watched an episode that landed in my lap last night. Kelly and I were watching 48 hours, and there were five men who were wrongly accused of of this crime, two of which got off and three of which went to prison, one of which 
basically uh, was paroled because of great behavior. Another witch was in prison for 25 years. When he got out, he didn't know his, his wife, didn't know his kids, didn't know any of them. And for years and years and years, they appealed and appealed and appealed and appealed. And here's why. is because there were five black men wrongly accused and convicted, three of them, for something that would never happen. And it was crazy because of this one man who happened to write a narrative that in the courtroom everybody believed in simply because of this one train of thought. All the evidence that I could see last night, which I'm not a detective, would suggest, though, that they wrongly accused five black men and and three of them lost a quarter of their lives at the hands of innocence. And what, what finally gave it away was is that they were able to conclude through DNA, which they had all along and had proven time and time again, though finally some de- technology came and it ruled out all five men that they couldn't be at the scene. Now, the reason I tell you that is this, is that I have a friend that's a black man. And he's a good friend of mine. Like we, we farm together, we hunt together, we talk together, we call each other all the time. And, I, and listen, I, I love him and he loves me. But if I honestly ask him and say, hey, have you ever been treated differently than me just because of your skin, skin color? And he answers, he goes, Brand, I wish I could say no, but, and I can't explain it to you. I have to believe him. And I don't understand exactly, but I go, I want to understand. Hey, would you help me to understand what it looks like to live a life in America in your shoes? That's a fair question. And you know why it's fair is because two of us are pumping gas after dark. And I'm pumping gas. And when he lines up to pump gas, he gets a call in the intercom that says, sir, you have to pay in store after dark. What? You didn't just intercom me. It's happening. And what would it look like if we just had the conversation with people that aren't like us? And here's why you do it. You get proximate so that you can be right. No, so that you can seek to understand. That's it. At the end of the day, you may disagree, and that's okay. But at least seek to understand. Do you know why? Here's why. Because the narrow, the, the window is closing. The opportunity is closing. The window is closing, and it's closing fast. It's closing right now in our country. I, I do not ever remember a time. I'm not a huge politic guy, but I've never seen all of the crazy influence that we've seen lately in terms of the hatred, the division, the divisiveness. I mean, that you're on my team or you're not. I've never seen it to the degree that it is now. But here's what I want you to realize. Regardless of what team you're on, if you're on Team Jesus, I think we got to take a step back and just say, God, would you inform my narrative in ways that I've never seen? Would you let me have conversations? Why? Because the window is closing. And here's what's closing. Not just culturally, but spiritually. I've been reading Revelation. I want you just to see Revelation 9 real quickly. Revelation 9, uh, one, verses 1 through 6. If you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. Uh, I don't have time to explain the entire text. If you ever have questions, I'd love to visit with you about it. It's a really fascinating text. Uh, but here's what you do have. In Revelation, you have a warning to the churches, uh, chapters 1 through 3. And then you're going to have chapter 4, John caught up to the heavens to see what's going on. Revelation 5, you have uh, Jesus who takes uh, the, the, the seal, uh, the, the scroll, and he has the right to open it. He's the only one because of him being, what, a lamb that was slain. Revelation 6, you then um, see kind of this, this span of what's going to happen in Revelation. You have these seals that are open. You have a quarter of the earth. Uh, that's going to die. Then Revelation 7, you have 144,000 sealed Jews for the purpose of God's glory in that seven-year tribulation to their going and they're sharing the message and the proclamation of hope and the uh, the goodness of God in spite of his judgment on the nation of Israel during this tribulation time. Now what happens, though, is this. After seals, you're going to have trumpet judgments. There's seven of those. And then after the trumpet judgments, you're going to have what you call Bold judgments, and those bold judgments are the final pouring out of God's judgment upon the earth in those times. And then you're going to have Jesus ushering in a new kingdom after you see a lot of other characters in there. And then 
He's going to come back riding on a white horse, Revelation 19. He's going to set up an eternal dominion. But here's the deal. In the middle of all this, Revelation 9, you see some of these trumpet judgments that are taking place. And the trumpet judgments, three, three or so are from God, and then there's going to be a handful of unleashed from the enemy. Now, the enemy is the adversary, Diabolos, the accuser, and he's going to unleash some demonic spirits from this place called the abyss, this area of gloomy darkness, in which I think, if you look very clearly at 2 Peter, you look at Jude, you look at Genesis 6, these are some uh, angelic beings that are the demonic forces that have been locked up for the day of the very end of life, and they sit in gloomy darkness until ultimately somebody unleashes them from this pit. And you go, why are they there? It's because they did evil acts in the days of Noah that God says you can't do. And so he's locked them up. But then he goes, I'm going to unleash them. In Revelation 9, they're unleashed. So here they are, Revelation 9. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star falling from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. For me, I believe, according to uh, Isaiah 14, that's the enemy, the adversary. Oh, what, morning star? The star uh, of the morning dawn, that's Satan. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke of a great fir- furnace, and the sun and all of the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft, and the smoke came locusts of the earth, and they were given power uh, like the power of scorpions of the earth. Now, this isn't literal locusts like you would see in the Old Testament that wipe out the Egyptians. This is, this is demonic forces that are going to come like locusts. Now, they're going to be there. If you look, he says they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant, but only the people who did not have the seal of God in their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. So they're allowed five months. And here's why. In the Old Testament, it only took five months for a swarm of locusts to devour everything and then move on. And so they're allowed five months. And what does God say? He goes, listen, even though you're from the demonic side, he goes, here's the key. You don't touch anything that's live and green. And he goes, and you only torment those that aren't mine. And you can only do so for five months and you can't kill them. So you see God's authority there, but I want you to see this. Look at verse uh, 6. They, verse 5 says they'll, they'll torment like a scorpion when it stings someone. That doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? In verse 6, and in those days people will seek death and they will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Have you ever been to a point where you go, wow, they would long to die and death will flee from them. Now here's the question. This hit me, and then I want to close with this. Is there anybody on earth that you hate so much that you would long for them to be tormented for five months like that? And I can honestly say, I don't think there's anybody that I would hate so much that I would want them to have that agonizing pain. But let me explain something to you. That five months is a speck on what people who do not know God will experience for all of eternity. That's the torment. That's the agony of not knowing Jesus. Now let me ask you a question. Is there anybody that you're unwilling to seek to understand their position so that maybe you would get to know them in such a way that you could share the message of hope and reconciliation of a God who can inform our narratives differently and ultimately save us from the patterns of our sin and give us new life in Christ? Isn't that what we are here for? And if not, I think we've got to question everything we believe and everything we've done because I can tell you I don't want anyone on this planet to not know Jesus. And it doesn't matter if they're black it doesn't matter if they're an atheist. It doesn't matter if they're a lesbian. It doesn't matter if they're a Muslim. I believe that Jesus saved me for the purpose of sanctifying me. And I think he's sanctifying me so that I would be a message of hope to people who do not know him. And I happen to believe that people who do not think like me are sinners who need to be set free. And I'm pretty sure that the way they think is the way they were raised. And it's the things they believe. It doesn't make them right and me wrong. It doesn't make me elite and them inferior. It just says that we need to have some conversations, and I think Jesus needs to inform those, and that's all my prayer is. Would you be willing to get proximate to people and things you don't understand so that maybe someone would come to know Jesus in the way that you do? Amen? Let me pray for us. God, we love you, and we pray, God, that in spite of the length of this, that God, somehow, some way, you'll use it for your glory and our good. God, we thank you that you, God, have informed our narrative and our way of thinking because of your word. And God, I would be the first to confess that I think I've had things wrong for a long time. And I'm so grateful that through seeking to understand other people and seeking to understand the counsel of your word, that God, you've changed many of the things that I view and think and say. And so God, I want to look more like you than I do like me. 
And I pray, God, that I would not push away other people who look a lot less like me. But God, would I realize that your goal is to reach those people for your purposes and for your cause so that they don't live in eternal agony separated from a God who loves them. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.